Holy how guys, this is the Jade Palace, a channel where we look at martial arts modernity through the prism of tradition. Right away, a small clarification for everyone who saw the debut breakdown of George St. Pierre's great career and thought this will be a channel dedicated only to fight analysis. What I'm aiming for here is to make this an overall education venue for traditional martial arts period, since there are so many myths and misconceptions about the subject. Fight analysis is definitely one of the formats that should prove useful, but not the only one. So for now my plan is to alternate between in-depth breakdowns of fighters that represent traditional styles, or at least as close as you can get to traditional styles in MMA context, and general educational short pieces on everything related to Chinese Kung Fu. And while with fight analysis there was no doubt in my mind that I should start with George, the greatest representative for traditional martial arts in MMA history, it took some time to decide what was the most important topic to get to in this first theme video. But then I asked myself, alright, if dispelling myths about traditional styles is the main goal of the channel, then what is the biggest and most fundamental of those misconceptions that people have? Then I realized it's sought to be wider than just martial arts, it is something about the way people think of tradition in general. To put it bluntly, it's the idea that traditional means set in stone once and for all, perfect for all time and not changing ever. And that is very much a misreading. Now I do fully realize there is something inherent about the traditionalist type of psyche that also makes it very defensive towards any change. In this yin-yang dichotomy between the left and the right, or progressive and conservative, the latter's role is by definition to be distrustful of every new idea, of any circumstance that changes the homeostasis, the current state of things. It's a mindset of if it's not broken don't fix it, the presumption that if something is already in place, you shouldn't touch it unless you absolutely have to which is naturally the opposite of the modernist default presumption that the old way has to be turned down unless you have very strong evidence that it's absolutely crucial to keep. So the question comes down to which side do you put the burden of proof on? Should the old or the new defend its right to exist against the court of public opinion? Here's the catch though. While it is true that the larger and more powerful a structure gets, the more it becomes inevitably concerned with its own preservation and conservation, there are certain communities that understand the necessity for change to a level where they build the self-challenge into their own DNA. In fact, funny enough, DNA are an example of such a system, since all evolution comes via random mutations, so both preservation of the old and introduction of the new are built into the core mechanics. A great example of such institute in our society is the scientific community. The mechanism for constantly challenging its own rigid understanding is at the heart of its philosophy. And martial arts, by their very Darwinian nature, are the same, a system built on challenging its own presumptions. And yet somehow there arises an idea in the larger martial arts community that this spirit of change only enters this world in the 20th century. Or, in most clinical cases, in 1993 with the first UFC event. Ridiculous as it is, some people actually managed to convince themselves that before, it was everyone sitting in their own corner, jealously guarding their centuries-old flaws of judgment without ever facing the outside world that would prove them wrong. And worse, that people who practice and promote traditional martial arts today are some kind of religious zealots whose main goal is to preserve their terrible ideas for generations to come. Don't get me wrong, I'm not blind and I'm not by any account denying the existence of BS artists who try to promote their own ignorance under the banner of tradition. If anything, as a student and instructor of an authentic Chinese style, I have more reasons to be angry at those types than people from the outside do. What I hope to show you today though, is that not only have those guys lost their connection to their own lineage, but that the very idea of being preservationist and uber conservative about your style is in fact very much in contradiction with the spirit of Chinese martial arts history as we know it. Makes sense to start with the Shaolin Kung Fu. Not only does it work chronologically and narratively, 
but even for the sheer cultural influence, for how much of a staple it became. Now, there are different views on how much Shaolin Kung Fu stands on its own. Some people say it's an absolutely unique case, while others see it as just the most famous representative of a larger trend of monastery Kung Fu all over the region. Personally, I think it's a little bit of column A and column B, and here's why. We don't have other examples of such developed and advanced monastery martial arts system, yet the logic at its foundations seem pretty universal. Not even just for China or East Asia, universal across the world. Think Lindisfarne and the whole Viking Raids era, for example. Even as the monks try to break free from the earthly possessions, any monastery still contains things like food, steel tools, ritual objects of worship made of precious metals, and people to be taken as slaves. And while for the most part they are protected by the air of holiness shared by the locals, every once in a while you get an especially cutthroat gang or a foreign military unit who don't give a damn. Which means, to have any hope for long-term survival, a medieval monastery has to be basically a mini-fortress, ready to defend its treasures and inhabitants. And as much as the generations of Shaolin warrior monks have turned their martial arts training into a form of spiritual, ascetic practice, to me there's no doubt the beginnings of it were much more prosaic and practical. Second key influence is that people came to monasteries from all walks of life, not even necessarily of their own volition. If you think of how brutal life was back in the day for most of the population, simple and strict yet at least relatively well-fed and secure monastic life might have been an out of starvation for many of the poorest. Ill and wounded would be brought in for medical treatment and then stay to work for the monastery as payment. Criminals and politically inconvenient voices would be sent there as a way to lock them up. Naturally, all sorts of folks were bringing in all sorts of backgrounds and experiences, including martial arts skills, which then inevitably got incorporated in some way into the larger system of teaching. So those two factors, the necessity for self-preservation and all kinds of influences, made monasteries and Shaolin specifically a natural melting pot. True, a very different kind than a competition deliberately set to find out what works and which school is the best one but a melting pot nonetheless. I mean, as much as looking at the Shaolin form curriculum immediately makes you question whether some of those elements came from different sources. Check this out, here's how mixed it immediately gets. I wanted to structure the video around a number of separate examples, looking at specific styles and their influences. And I already cannot make this separation, since this next one concerns two major styles, both Shaolin and Tan Lan Chuan, the fist of the praying mantis. No, that's not right either. It's not really fair to call mantis a style. Rather, it is a huge branch of traditional Chinese martial arts, one that involves multiple individual schools. Lo and behold, here's an 18th century manuscript, or by some accounts a 13th century manuscript that was lost and rediscovered in 1794 listing different techniques or fighting methods brought in by 18 masters whom the Shaolin abbot Fu Zhu invited to the monastery to share wisdom. That's basically the same claim we always hear about martial arts system today, that they looked at different styles and gathered the most effective elements from all of them. Fair enough, the only problem is somehow the notion often gets labeled as quote-unquote modern, contradicting traditional sensibility. And yet, here are Kung Fu masters doing just as much hundreds of years ago. Now, clearly this story intertwines fact with legend, making lots of assumptions and allowances. But funny enough, historical accuracy doesn't really matter for our today's discussion. Fact or fiction, the important part is that this story still illustrates the mindset that was part of Kung Fu during that era. It shows that while some masters might have jealously guarded their secrets, in parallel, there also existed a culture of free exchange of knowledge, much akin to that in early sciences. Going forward, let's look at one Sun Lutang, widely regarded as one of the key figures in Wushu development at the turn of the 20th century. He's known first and foremost as the founder of so-called internal family school. And if you've come over his name in passing, it's most likely have been dragged into an argument about separation between internal and external wushu systems. 
Which is rather ironic that this is what people today tend to call upon his authority for, given that Lutan himself was an outspoken critic of this whole separation into internal and external. But what can you do? If you fight to slay a dragon, your name will forever be tied to the beast, whether you succeed or not. Be it as it may, what's important to our current discussion is that the whole internal family branding comes from Lu Tang being a student of three styles that many both then and today regard as the pinnacle of internal practices. The base art he started with in his 20s was Xin Yi Chuan, the feast of form and intention, known for its linear, straightforward aggression. During the next decade of his life, after moving to another province, he was able to complement it with a system that at a first glance might seem the direct opposite in its approach. Baguazhang, or the Eight Trigram Palm, aka Airbending from Avatar, is famous for its evasive maneuvering and circling footwork patterns. Lutan, however, was able to see past the surface differences in strategy and concentrate on the common principles in mechanism of energy generation and control, which was helped by the third art he studied many years later, the Wu style Tai Chi Chuan with its emphasis on maintaining the spherical defensive force called Peng, and arguably even more focus on using Qi over Li, or relaxed internal power instead of tense and inefficient external energy. So here you go, as quintessential a story of style mixing as you can get. A guy started with one art in his youth, spent a decade studying it, then the next 20 years learning the style that is, in some ways, its opposite, then the rest of his life was dedicated to both mastering a third school and mixing all three in a system of his own that he will pass on to the next generation. Even though technically sound style is considered a branch of Tai Chi Chuan, everyone accepts the profound influence of Lutan, Xin Yi and Bago experience. What's more, there are schools today that deliberately set for every student to relive on Lutan's journey of exploration under their curriculum. Tai Chi is the most sophisticated of the Chinese fighting systems. Only after Master Hung's students have mastered the other arts are they finally allowed to learn this. Of course, in a video like that we cannot forget about everyone's favorite, Wing Chun. Though, as you can expect for such a widespread style, its origins are a highly contested topic. Most would be familiar with the legend about a nun by the name of Nun Mui. But from what we know today, she looks more like a mythical character that many martial arts lineages claim as their founder. Same goes for a version about connection to Southern Shaolin, which has been proven to be a fictional spot, yet is cited as a birthplace by dozens of Kung Fu styles. What can be considered canon, though, is Wing Chun's roots in both Fujian Bai He or White Crane and Emei, specifically 12 pillars of Emei Shi Archo and Neigong, also called the snake technique. This fusion goes so far that some sources describe Wing Chun as the crane's wings connected to the snake's body. I know, right? How's that for a mix of styles? Pretty cool, I would say, and a rather convincing illustration for how much importance those who practiced it back in the day placed on those types of connections. And by the way, back in the day in this case is at least the middle of the 19th century and possibly as far back as the early 700s, so as traditional as it gets. If you watched the previous video, you already know that I subscribe to the school of thought that counts Okinawan karate schools as part of the southern kung fu culture, and it makes all the more sense to mention this island while we're on the subject of style mixing. Many of you would have heard of this connection, if only through the Karate Kid second movie, where the old man Miyagi tells a legend about the ancient patriarch of his family traveling to mainland China, studying there and bringing this new knowledge back home with him. Ten years later he come back with Chinese wife and two kids and secret of Miyagi family Karate. This is a reference to the historical connection between the systems of Goju-ru, literally hard soft style in Japanese and mostly the prototype for Miyagi Karate in the movies, and the continental style of White Crane from the Fujian province. Political grievances between China, Okinawa and Japan aside, we see another archetypical story. Someone studied local styles, moved, studied local styles elsewhere, 
looked at the strengths and weaknesses of each, combined the best of both worlds. How's that so different from the so-called modern approach? Kanbun Uichi, whose legacy is revered in a school named after him, is another example of a guy who traveled to Fujian and found himself a master there. By the way, if you start to wonder why this specific region keeps popping up, in this case it's just a question of geography, Fujian is simply the closest province of China to Okinawa, but there are much more curious coincidences. For example, the style that he studied on the mainland was called Pangainun, which translates from Cantonese as half hard and half soft. Well, well, where did we hear that one before, eh? If anything, this is the perfect illustration for the level of interconnection and cultural traffic that was constantly going on in the region. At this point, the idea of traditional martial arts being oh so isolated and protectionist starts looking positively ludicrous, doesn't it? On a fun note, I'm sure you've all seen those memes about how Japanese people don't distinguish between the R and L sounds and how it leads to all kinds of awkwardness when they try to speak Ingrishu. Well, another prominent Okinawan school bears the name of Shorinru. And what does that sound like if you substitute R for L? Exactly. This school's roots also come from China and it is named specifically in honor of its Shaolin heritage. So as you can see, between the three arguably most well-known Okinawan karate styles, we have, once more, three iterations of mixing between traditional Tei of the island and exported mainland's wushu. And obviously I cannot forget my own school, Ilikchuan. Grandmaster Qin Likun, the founder of the system, studied Kung Fu his whole life and through the years learned several distinct arts. Many of you will be familiar with this somewhat overly generic but still useful classification of Chinese wushu into northern and southern styles. And thus, being a descendant of a nomadic Hakka clan that roamed both north and south, in a way, Likun was also following their tradition of learning and absorbing knowledge from styles of both branches, just as they did to defend their caravans on the road. All your formations! The Kodos must be protected! As you already guessed, in time he distilled the common foundational principles between those schools, which led to the creation of original Ilikchuan and later to his sons Ilikchuan Zhongxindao that we know today. Different names, different schools, same pattern. One last thing that I want to address today is that as much as this idea of traditional schools as rigid and unchanging is mostly a caricature, there is a little bit of a rationale behind it. As far as it is true that historically many schools very jealously guarded the secrets of their training. For example, Yan Luchang, the founder of Yang style Tai Chi Chuan, famously had to spy on hidden training of Fu Chang clan members and expected to be severely punished when he was found out. So that part is grounded in reality. The problems start when people conflate this historical truth with the modern trend of being a self-righteous fanboy for your chosen style who thinks training anything else is below them. That is, in fact, a very modern attitude that you can only afford in today's safe cozy world. That's not to say that arrogant talk about your school being the best itself is anything new. An 18th century practitioner would talk just as much trash about every other art being inferior to their family system. The difference is, the moment an opportunity presents itself to get their hands on other people's secret, they'd be all over it before you finish the sentence. So yes, medieval exchange of martial arts knowledge was not always an open and friendly version we have today, but that shouldn't mean it didn't happen. If anything, it shows this knowledge was that much more valuable, and people would sacrifice much to obtain it. In conclusion, let me try and hammer this point home once more, because I feel it's an important one. There exists this perception of two schools of thought between traditional martial artists, one trying to preserve tradition by conservation and another going away from it in their attempts to modernize it. And I feel that perception is deeply wrong, on both ends actually. As these examples above and many other clearly show, there's nothing inherently modern about mixing or developing the styles, it's always been part of the culture since the ancient times. Our grandmaster always gets these accusations thrown at him, 
Oh, but your students fight in combat sports. You fought when you were young, so that means you're taking it in a modern sport direction. And yet, as long as we have a record, every generation of practitioners were doing just as much with the challenges available to their era. Modern combat sports, including MMA, as much as some people love to present them as a never-before-seen revolution, they're nothing more than a new iteration of the same age-old approach. So, on one hand, people who are taking the conservationist attitude to their style probably do it because they honestly feel that is the best way to respect and preserve it. Yet that's exactly the attitude that directly contradicts what tradition was always about. So, in a way, they might be preserving the letter of their lineage while kind of going against its spirit. On the other hand, Kung Fu practitioners who are open to learning from everyone and exchanging experiences with students of other arts are doing no more and no less than the generations of their Shifus did back in their day. And the fact that today this exchange and learning process has a new acronym behind it and involves a different shaped arena or funny gloves, in the end those things are just cosmetics, so don't get stuck on that, alright? Instead of being afraid of it as something modern that brings you away from authentic roots, I think it's high time we see that style mixing is, and always was, a crucial part of real tradition that just got somewhat forgotten in the last few decades and is definitely worth going back to. Thank you for watching. If you enjoy this, kindly project your chi towards the like and subscribe buttons. Also, you know by now that yours truly is on a mission to educate people and dispel myths about traditional martial arts. So if you think it's a noble cause and want to participate, there is no better way than to share this on your social media. And if you're seriously committed, you can even become a supporter of the channel. Which, by the way, also allows you to watch original, less heavily edited cuts. Finally, and most importantly, if you want to come and learn Kung Fu with us, all the links to the school are below. And remember, style is a crystallization, you know, I mean, that way it's a process of continuing growth.